This is the No Stroke Podcast with your co-hosts, David Dancero and Michael Garrow, helping you to support and thrive in life after stroke. Their podcast is designed for educational and community support purposes only and should not replace medical treatment and guidance of your own health professional team. Hello and welcome to the No Stroke Podcast. We are recording this morning of Thursday, June 16th. Um, it's going to be a hot and sticky one here in New York, I think, for us. But our guest is joining us all the way from London, England today. So we'd love to have international guests on. Um, it's our pleasure to introduce Dan Kendall to the pod. Thanks, Thanks for very much. Us, Dan. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Morning, Dan. Good morning. So we've, for us. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've heard a couple times um, nicknames go out for you, Dan. Um, the grandfather of digital health podcasting, you know, the, the OG or <laughs> the first one to really kind of grasp the horns of, of podcasting and, and take it and run. So, you know, we're, we're delighted to have this chat with you today. Um, for our listeners, um, this will be a little different than most. Um, you know, we're going to be focusing kind of on this podcasting. Obviously, you, you guys have been loyal listeners over the last year or so. Um, and we really want to explain, as we highlighted in one of our past episodes, kind of the direction that we're trying to take the podcast um, and really just this form of podcasting and kind of what it means, where we see it going. Um, and Dan's that guy to let us kind of have a look behind the curtain. So um, for our listeners, Dan, can you just give a brief kind of introduction? You, you know, who's Dan sure. Kendall, where are you now, and a little bit on, on um, mission-based media? Sure. So I'm Dan Kendall. Uh, I am an international guest for you coming here from Kent, England, which is southeast of London. I like to say it's the county just above France. It sounds a bit more European that way. But southeast England is where I live now. Been here for 19 years, but I'm originally from Virginia. And uh, I've maintained my strong American accent for all these years here. So happy to continue that. Uh, I studied engineering at Virginia Tech. I got into healthcare right after university. Actually, I got into technology, I should say, right university and got into healthcare shortly after that and have spent nearly 30 years in uh, working in healthcare to innovate bring new products to market working very working between very clever clinicians uh, nurses doctors researchers that can develop new uh, or deliver great care um, and also working with really smart engineers uh, developers, uh, scientists that can actually develop new solutions based on uh, a well-presented problem uh, with uh, the different variables identified. And that's when I bring my engineering experience to it to try to define the variables and the problem and then let those people do their best work and then try to translate that into the market through regulatory requirements, commercial pathways, reimbursement strategies, uh, user experiences, and trying to get people to use it, whether they're clinicians or end users, patients, consumers um, that need to be able to use these products. So that's been my, where my career has been. Uh, I started podcasting because nobody was doing one that I wanted to listen to in the space that I was working in, which was uh, called digital health. Um, I've been involved with technology before it was called digital health, e-health, health, IT, uh, m-health, <clears throat> all these different things. And uh, when I realized that nobody was able to create a, a podcast that I was uh, interested in listening to uh, because nobody was talking about this new area of medicine, I thought, well, actually, I can create this. I can I can solve for the variables here and, and bring something to market. So I don't know that I'm necessarily the OG in terms of uh, doing it, but I certainly didn't want to do podcasting in healthcare the way that it, I, I had seen it be done up until 2016. And I've just been extraordinarily fortunate where I walked through that door uh, in 2016 to, to create a hobby of, of podcasting. Within two years, that became a business. A year after that, in 2019, I formed Mission Based Media. And um, the rest is history that's uh, being written. Very cool. And like, like most, I feel like, you know, we've, we've, well, when I say most, most in the healthcare industry, you chose healthcare, which is a very difficult field, right? You know, and you know, you've been an innovator, leading products in the space, and now you know in this media space. Um, you know, what what really led you down to focus your attention in healthcare? You know, um, you know, I, I actually wasn't very interested in healthcare in my very early, you know, my early 20s, uh, I, I actually thought it was something I wanted to avoid. I didn't like the idea of being around people whose uh, um, bodies 
weren't weren't well. It it, it was a little bit. It, it frightened me a little bit in my early twenties. But then when I began to be, get exposed through charities I was involved with, with the the um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me, hopefully you can edit that out, guys. Um, uh, so w- when I began to work through the charities I was involved with, people with people who are really mission-driven and, and purposeful about their work, I was so attracted to um, the, the spirit about and the capacity of what they were doing as professionals. And I thought, I want to be a part of that. I, I mean, they're making change for people's brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers, sons and daughters. And the, the, the impact of that, what, what I sort of get a little philosophical about is the impact of that when you, uh, when you guys help a person get better, uh, an individual, I, I get a little philosophical thinking about all the impact that that has in their relationships with their partners, with their children, with their parents, and the, the ongoing impact that's immeasurable. Yes, you can measure somebody's uh, mobility and their gait, and you can do all sorts of things in healthcare. But the impact on society, on families, on relationships, um, and the opportunity to get people to a place where they're able to contribute in a way that they are living their best life is just really something we can't measure. And I, I was really inspired to be a part of that and use the skills that I have um, to support people in the industry in whatever way possible. Yeah, and and I know we spoke, you know, for when when we first got connected, um, Dan, kind of on our why and our mission, and really one I love the name mission based media because I feel like it, you know, you're behind it mission, and it's it it really drives that meaning um, of what you're in it for, um, you know. But for David and I, you know, we both have, and our listeners know, um, a personal connection to stroke. Right. And that's why we're focused on stroke. And that's why we continue to do what we do, because we have that drive. Um, And I know when we first connected, you spoke that um, one of your children was diagnosed with type one diabetes. So what is what does that mean? Like holding on to that why in you. Right. Like that that probably is a huge driver for you each day. And I know you've done some creative things with type one diabetes. But do you want to just speak, you know, a little bit on that and kind of what drives you there? Yeah, well, in my early 20s, when I was describing that sort of early uh, aversion being around healthcare uh, facilities, uh, you know, I really didn't have a lot of life experience about all the different things that can impact our health. And and health really is something that that many of us take for granted. And it really is something that, you know, when you lose it, you, you lose a lot. Um, and through my career, I've really worked with professionals and, and organizations trying to bring new products to market, improve healthcare that way. I haven't had a lot of um, professional experience working directly with the benefactories of those services. Um, but in my personal life, yeah, I've, I've had people that I love and care about affected by Alzheimer's, colon cancer, breast cancer, skin cancer. You just can't live and have any sort of relationship with the outside world and not see how these things affect people. And, you know, being empathetic, being understanding, being supportive, because everybody's carrying something is really uh, an important thing um, that I think we all need to embody. But when it, when you bring a condition into your home, when it affects your body, when it affects someone that you're really close to, like a child, um, it, it's a whole new level of reality. I had worked with a diabetes company and done done some great work bringing products to market that that support people with diabetes. But even though I'd done that work for about four years, I didn't understand what that condition was really like until my daughter received her diagnosis in 2019. And um, I talk all the time about how great the care team has been. I talk about it to their faces and I talk behind their backs about how wonderful the professionals are. They are so supportive of my daughter and her extended you know, caregivers, carers, uh, my, myself and my ex-wife included. But th- what they're able to give you is just a small fraction of what you really need as a person who's responsible for that condition full time. And if it had happened to me, if I'd received the diagnosis, I know what I would do. I'd go quiet and reserved, do a lot of analysis before I even ventured out to some of my closest family or friends to say, hey, you know, I've got this and what do you know? But with it, when it happened to my daughter, Within hours, probably the, the you know certainly the same afternoon she was diagnosed in the morning. By afternoon, I'm sure I was putting up flares to friends and family, saying, "I don't know what this is going to mean, and I need help. Who do you know?" And I did not know anybody in my immediate circle who had type one diabetes, but I knew people who knew people, and um, I was so touched by the community that reached out to me and 
strangers to me, over a dozen, I lost count at 12, um, uh, over a dozen people spent time with me as strangers to them explaining what their experience had been like and that was so impactful so even though we had a wonderful care team we were able to get diagnosed and we were able to get in care within hours of that diagnosis within minutes here really um the reality was outside of that environment outside of that healthcare environment is where we spend most of our lives and that's where people were really helping me and that's what led the sort of epiphany that actually we need to bottle these conversations or create podcasts around some of these conversations so that other people can benefit from the dozen or so people that shared their time with me. And now, years into my journey, I've been fortunate on many occasions to be the one getting that call to say, hey, my friend's daughter's been diagnosed. Can you speak with them about, you know, they're in the same, one of the greatest quotes that I heard was, uh, they said, they were in this, they were the same way that you were. Uh, they were, they were, the, they were as lost as you were. Um, when you received your diagnosis for your daughter and, and you do feel lost and being able to support people by creating podcasts that can support them is really key. And that's led to what we're doing with Health Unmuted, which is part of the business I run, Mission Based Media. Yeah, and that was, uh, there's nothing more powerful than an, a, an empowered uh, parent, right? That, that, that to, <laughs> to, to see and, and to see what sort of was missing in, in the, the, the caregiver's journey and as well as um, seeing how that community stepped up to you. It can, you could tell that that made, that made an impact that there were strangers coming up to you and offering to share their insights because they, they probably obviously put themselves in, in that perspective and knew that you were, you were hurting and your family had probably more questions and answers, especially as, as, as parents. Um, were you, can I ask, were you already on the timeline? Were you already doing your work with uh, Digital Health Today before, as this was ongoing, as this new diagnosis with your daughter? Or what was the timeline between that yeah. and, and transitioning into that's, the work you do? Yeah, that's a great question. So my daughter was diagnosed, one of, I have two daughters. One of my daughters was diagnosed in 2019, and I'd been podcasting since 2016, started doing it full-time in 2018. 18, but I've been a podcast listener for, since the early days, since my 80 gigabyte uh, iPod that I got with the black and white screen and the rotor dial. Remember those? Um, so I'd been listening to them for a long time uh, and doing a lot of international traveling, consuming a lot of podcasts, which gave me the idea of actually, I bet I can do this. And a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, um, when I called him up uh, and said, hey, how hard is it to start a podcast? He and I had, had a radio show in college, which was my on only audio, audio experience. And uh, he and I did the show together and he went on to become an audio engineer in Nashville. And I called him up and said, hey, how hard, how hard is it to start a podcast? He said, oh, it's easy. And uh, so he lied and uh, <laughs> said, it's easy. You guys know how hard it is to do. Actually creating an MP3 file is not a problem. Getting a podcast heard is the real challenge, right? And it's like anything with innovation, like making it is, is part of the challenge, but actually getting it used and, and seen and accepted and used consistently is the big challenge. So uh, I was fortunate that I was able to go through that experience and uh, in 2016, 17, 18, and have that, that uh, podcasting experience and be doing it full time. And then it was 2019 when my daughter was diagnosed. I also formed the business mission based media at that point. Um, and that's when I started to realize the opportunity to create uh, what is now being called uh, uh, this, this branded as health unmuted. It's an audio library of podcast mini series that are really designed to share the the uh, the human aspects of the first steps with a condition. So we have over 50 conditions identified that are on our short list of, of things. We have a shorter list that's about 10 that we're working on in some uh, capacity at any given time. We just released the Alzheimer's podcast, which is only the second uh, series and really the first in some respects in that our uh, first one that we did last year was really a pilot to sort of test the hypothesis. If we create a mini series around our condition, will people find it consistently and will the audience continue to grow over time and um, a lot of people in healthcare have a lot of resistance to change a lot of antibodies to protect against that infection of innovation um, and and I know that and I've worked in this industry for a long time it took me a long time to realize that we just need to start building it for people to realize that this is a journey that they should go on so we did that pilot last year uh, in, in collaboration with the COPD foundation there in the states uh, that's been a wonderful collaboration and a wonderful success in creating that that podcast 
cost initially, and then we were able to work with an organization called Altoida, uh, which is doing some diagnostic testing using AI and smartphones. Um, and they supported us creating the Alzheimer's podcast. We also next month have the Parkinson's podcast. So this is picking up momentum. And uh, um, uh, we're going to be doing more and more of these things working with collaborators because once the, the industry begins to see the impact and hear the impact of what the what podcasting could do. Um, I believe we're going to have a, a lot of great opportunities to make an impact with uh, patient communities and professionals. Yeah, I think, you know, and I'd love to dive more into this, the health unmuted, because I think it's such a unique listening experience that you've created, right? It's different than any other healthcare related podcast that I've listened to so far. Um, it's more of like a crime show <laughs> type way, you know? Like, <laughs> like, like, you know like the curation of it you know yeah. like how you bring someone on a on a story you're not just spilling out facts and losing interest right away like you captivate the audience you bring them on this journey with you um and for our listeners it's not dan actually behind the voice so you, you like and maybe dan i'll let you speak to kind of the curation of this but um you know, I, I listened to the Alzheimer's one. I've listened to the COPD one in, in bits and pieces as well. Um, and it just, it, it really kind of puts you in your seat and you sit there and you, you know, you're really in, you're in it. You're not kind of that outside lens trying to understand some of the scientific jargon that maybe a, you know, a neurologist or an expert's on there talking to. I think you kind of do a great job of bringing it down to that level. So I know, you know, we'll talk to some of the work that we might be able to do on this kind of similar style within stroke. Um, but for our listeners, can you kind of bring them through maybe your style and the, how you curate these podcasts, specifically to a mini series, right? Because a mini series, maybe it's the first time someone's hearing this term. So can right. you just give a bit of a, a background and kind of how, you, how you're sure. Maybe Sure, happy to do that. So you remember I described earlier that I've always worked between really clever groups of people, really talented health professionals that are doing great work and might be encountering problems, some problems they might not realize that they have, uh, because that's just the way it's always worked, and very clever people who are able to design solutions when the problem is defined and the variables are given. Um, and that's really what I've been able to do with Health Unmuted. Um, I, I am so pleased at the, the the quality that's been created, but I can't really take credit for it. It's just like the products that I had a hand in designing. I, I can't really claim much credit. I just define the problem really well and uh, define the variables and then get out of the way to let the people who are really good at that, um, that creating those solutions, and in this case, creating stories, do their best work and try to remove friction and find ways to, to bring things to market. So I did it with medical devices. I did it with uh, digital uh, health solutions. And now I, I'm able to do it uh, working with uh, a variety of, of really talented people and people in the healthcare space, yourselves included. You know, we, I look forward to working with you on the stroke podcast that we have planned for later this year. Um, so really what, as I said, we sort of defined the problem. What we want to do is we want to stay human-centered, evidence-based, and high quality. Um, when people hear podcasts, they often think about things like we're doing. And I love what we're doing right now. These conversations where people are able to talk about their work and, and get to know each other. And it really is a way to uh, introduce ideas and cultivate ideas and relationships in a one-to-many format. So I'm grateful for you guys having me here. When it comes to patient education, what I've, what I've articulated to my team is really this is a product. This is a product we're making and we need to understand how we can bring a person on their journey. We need to understand where they are. They probably just received a diagnosis. They're probably scared, confused, a little overwhelmed, anxious, not sure how to talk about it with their partner, not talk, and sure how to talk about it with their adult children or their young children or their employer. Uh, not sure what this means for their college education or their their, uh, their own education. In the case of my daughter, she was had to go back to school with her uh, diagnosis days after having uh, received it and all the peripheral equipment and requirements of, of managing that condition 24-7. Um, so really what we're trying to do is, is create short form podcasts. We don't go over 22 minutes. Um, we keep them engaging we use music we use sound effects we use the the voices of people who have experienced this condition either as a patient or as a caregiver and then we also supplement that with additional medical insights and information from the people who are properly trained and credentialed and qualified to be able to have those conversations it is not it is not medical advice 
We are not giving anybody medical advice, but we are giving people the, the basis of knowledge around what neurotransmitters are or what the definition of chronic pulmonary, uh, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder uh, disease is um, and able to give that insight around the basis about what it is, what are the symptoms, how is it diagnosed? What are the tests? You know, what's a spirometry test? What does that even mean? And who are the therapists that are involved in the care? Who am I going to meet along the way? What should I be asking uh, the, the doctors that I may have forgotten to ask when I was in that clinical environment, in the clin clinical situation? What are the other resources that are available? We're not trying to answer every question that someone has. There are other podcasts that are out there that do a great job of doing that. They have hundreds of episodes around various conditions, you know, like what you guys are doing around stroke. And we want to steer people to that. But we realized, like I did when my daughter was diagnosed and I was in the podcast space and I looked for podcasts, the two types of podcasts I found were ones by like Stacey Sims. I'll give a shout out to her. She's a wonderful lady, mission driven, son was diagnosed with diabetes and that put her on a new path using her broadcast skills to create a fantastic podcast. But when, when my daughter I know she was hundreds of podcasts into her journey, and I was not ready to hear about somebody climbing Kilimanjaro with type 1 diabetes. Didn't It wasn't relevant to me. My daughter was still in the hospital. I needed to get her four miles home, <laughs> not miles up into the air. Um, and the other type of podcast was you know, done, done by like the American Diabetes Association, doing great work, fantastic work, really grateful. But again, I don't need to hear about a clinical study that was presented at their last annual conference. Doesn't help me get my child home and on our uh, path to our new reality. So I thought, well, let's create this um, in ways in short form that we can send people uh, to the information, also provide resources to the family members or the colleagues of uh, and friends of people who are diagnosed with these things and help them on their path. Yeah, uh, I'll just I'll just add uh, to, to Mike's comments there, Dan. That uh, listened to the COPD and the Alzheimer's one last night, and really, really well done uh, from the music to the to the interpretation. I, I hope I get your uh, one of the voices of at least the Alzheimer's one. Is it Mackenzie, Michaela? Uh, Michaela, Michaela, wonderful Michaela. talent. She's Very, amazing. Yeah, she, really well. It, it, you know, when when you you have the clinician uh, giving an explanation. And maybe it is in clinical terms. She brings it down to layperson's ease, where she just 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 flowed perfectly. And the additional um, resources that you put at after each episode from the professional associations for further, you know, to take a deeper dive, and also the perspective on the the writings. Uh, there was I know in the Alzheimer's episode, for example, you listed the you know, uh, individuals that have caregivers or individuals living with Alzheimer's now books that they have written. So really well done. I'm very excited to bring that lens to, to Mike and I, Mike and, my, and our uh, mission uh, around stroke. So um, just uh, very excited. Excited. Thank, thank you so much for your kind words. Uh, I mean, uh, I had a high expectation um, for what this was going to, to, to sound like and what the, the power of that would be to, to deliver. Um, and I really feel like the team has has way over delivered on my already high expectations. And and Mike, you mentioned the the name of the business, Mission Based Media. I named that biz, I named the business that very intentionally to work as a magnet. Um, and just like a magnet has two sides, um, I find that it is a wonderful name to attract the sort of people. Many of the people that are on the team have said, hey, when I saw a job posting and it was from a company, Mission Based Media, I had to click to find out what that was about. That's wonderful to have that sort of draw towards even just talking about mission based as a, as a company philosophy. But then it also really repels the people who I don't want to work with. I'm, I'm too long in my career and I've dealt with too many people that I'd rather not work with again, uh, that I just don't, don't want to uh, go down the profit motive or, or anything that could be anywhere exploitative or, or not contributing to the advancement of society. And what I really love about what we're all doing in health is that healthcare might be a vertical, but health is a horizontal. Health impacts your education, it impacts your transportation decisions, where we live, what we eat, how we move, who we have relationships with, where we work, uh, where we live, how we power our communities, how we elect officials. Health is a horizontal that cuts across every aspect of our lives. And we, and we really don't really think about it until we start to lose it and uh, or someone we care about has, has lost an aspect of their health. And that's where you know, I just feel really privileged to be on this journey and, um, and grateful for all the people that I've been able to meet like yourselves along the way. Thank you for those kind of words, Dan. I, I think we uh, we have another group of podcasters to thank for the connection. 
Um, and uh, you know, uh, Eugene and Jim, who run Digital Health or Shout at Digital Health, and they're they're in your podcast network as well. Um, yeah, it, it it it's something special. Um, and I think really what what the curation it's like that trusted source right of information right and i think that's what's unique about what you're building and why we really want it to be a part of the network as well right because there's so many things out there there's so many google searches you could do and, and be terrified when you're in that situation um and we we always ask people especially survivors when we have folks on to the podcast even caregivers um our question around kind of what would and we'll ask you a similar question at the end around a, a magic wand like how would you redesign this the stroke care pathway and it's often said that it's some sort of guide or tool right when you know after that diagnosis when you're leaving the hospital when there's so many questions to be answered what's that next step and how do i get there um and i think what we're building here could be that right um, my question to you, and I think it kind of goes to some of the framework of how you bring in partners to, to kind of curate and deliver some of these shows, it's when we talk about barriers in healthcare, the often, often the biggest barrier is getting it to the consumer's hand, getting a patient's hand. So how are you getting around that barrier? Um, and what's your kind of strategy to get these two patients? Right. Okay. So uh, great question. Um, lots, lots of things that we can talk about there. So first of all, uh, like many things in healthcare, the person who benefits um, might not be making that decision for themselves initially. They may not be made aware of it, uh, except through a healthcare professional's recommendation. When my daughter was diagnosed, they gave us a bag full of information, equipment, books, uh, recommendations of uh, charities and things like that. And of course, I then looked for podcasts and I went back to them and said, hey, where did you, how did you decide what to put in that bag of materials, the teddy bear, the referral to JDRF, all these different things. And they said, oh, well, we just came up with that on our own. And I said, oh, so there's not like a official hospital uh, package that you give. And they said, no, just our own experience that we just decided this is what our patients need. And I said, well, great. What podcast can I listen to? And they looked at me with a blank face. They said, we don't know any podcasts. And I said, Oh, geez, well, that's an opportunity. What if there was a podcast, would you recommend it to people? And they said, Hell, yeah. I'm sorry, you guys. Uh, I don't want to make you guys have to mark the expli explicit. So heck, yes, that they said. Um, uh, so yeah, so so uh, sorry, remind me of the question, Mike, I, I'm going to go down a pathway here. Sorry, yeah, the so we we were talking through like how we're getting this into the patient's hands right the bear and the, right. some of the barriers maybe together yeah thank you so that so that sort of led me to realize well i need to engage the medical professionals in the creation of this and the awareness of this so part of doing is we're working with professional organizations. I mentioned the American Association, uh, I think I mentioned it, the American uh, Orthopedic Association, which is, excuse me, the American Association of Orthopedic Surgeons, which is one of our clients. We're working with them to, to try to get podcast information out to their professionals. We're working with the American Pharmacists Association as a client to produce their podcast and working with them to help them be aware of information that's available for uh, their members as pharmacists or orthopedic surgeons as it may be, but also how to make Make that available for their patients. Um, we created Health Podcast Network, which you guys are a part of. Um, we created that initially to try to curate high quality content that wasn't being surfaced by Apple. And and I guess in one way <laughs> that I'm sort of a, a, an old dog in this uh, area of podcasting is when I started podcasting, Apple was really the only game in town. Google had Google Play, not Google Podcasts. Spotify was only doing music. Um, and Amazon Music was not even a thing. So app, it was Apple and a bunch of other smaller apps that you could get if you were some sort of niche po power podcast listener. Um, so Health Podcast Network was a way to begin curating that health professionals really found value in the content there. And they began to say to me, hey, this is really great to see things there and to find things and to hear voices that I wouldn't have ever heard of. I was listening to one podcast a week. Now I'm listening to five or 10 on my commute and on coffee breaks while I'm exercising or cooking or shopping, whatever. That's great. And then they started to ask me, what podcast can you suggest for our listeners, uh, for, our, for our patients rather? And I thought, that's the same thing I asked my healthcare team. And I thought, 
the doctors and nurses and therapists that are taking care of patients need to be aware of these things so they can be able to say, hey, here's a bag of stuff for your new condition, and here's what you're going to need to do for the next six weeks, and here's some stuff you can listen to on your drive home. So some of the the, the tactics, you know, press releases, uh, we're doing TikTok videos. We have some of those coming out this week. Uh, we're, we're converting some of the podcasts, some of the ones you've heard, into TikTok videos, YouTube shorts, Instagram reels. We're doing organic content doing paid promotion. Uh, we're working to get this as a partner with um, uh, uh, providers. So we want to license this content. Um, we're still working out the, the model for how that's going to work exactly. But having healthcare providers embed this on their website, or at least link to it so that they can help their medical professionals be more efficient with helping their patients understand conditions better by giving them another tool that they don't have to read. Um, so, so trying to remove some of the friction in the whole process so people can uh, know about it, which in involves the professionals, be told about it, which involves the, the, the patients and the caregivers, and then have an easy, uh, frictionless way of accessing it through the places where they already spend time, social media, their smartphones, the internet, uh, QR codes, being able to distribute this in multiple ways uh, to get into the heads, literally, and through the eardrums of the target listener. Yeah, that that's so perfect. Um, I just I think at first I need a T-shirt. Health is horizontal. I I love that. I love that. <laughs> so <laughs> give you full credit. Uh, but uh, um, um, I, I I love what you mentioned too in terms of getting it out into the community and getting it out to caregivers. So for 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 speaking for myself, and I know Mike and I have had this conversation. Some of the most rewarding work we do is with our survivor groups. And, and during the pandemic, we, we started a program called The Next Step Forward. And as we've kind of emerged over the last few years in doing this, we've actually become guests in different, in different survivor community support groups. And what you mentioned is so important that this digital tool could be part of that whole experience because folks might come into that survivor group brand new and want to kind of have a one on 101 understanding or have the ability to digest some of this material of their own time, or they may be in that group for three or four years and they're looking for another way to share their experience through the lens that they might not be able to describe themselves. I mean, you, you mentioned, if we just go back quickly to that Alzheimer's uh, uh, episode that I just consumed last night, that was, that hit home for me because I, personal connection my my grand we lost my grandmother to the, to alzheimer's and just when what uh, the gentleman's name who 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 you mentioned or was on the episode how he explained how um what that looked like through his own experience and just like trying to identify a neighbor and the little cues and just the way you broke that down to be able mm -hmm. to have someone understand you know i look for i, I might not be able to recognize that person's face, but I still recognize my neighbor by the dog that they're walking. So I put those two together and can have that still have that relationship. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited um, about uh, bringing a new way to present our material and a new, uh, you know, to, 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 to work together on this stroke project, because one thing we've, we've, um, you know, the, the, the term we often use, the thing that's common about stroke is there's no two strokes are the same so yeah. everyone's strokes experience and survivor experience is uniquely different but those experiences that come across through as many channels as possible can help that person in their journey so um i i'm i'm very excited and, and i'm also excited to to uh, learn more about TikTok. that's great that you guys are doing that because but i've been asking my kids for a while to help me understand and how to get it out there so i'm going to be following your lead dan my oldest is mortified uh, <laughs> so we're still trying to figure that out but it's a, it's a powerful platform um and and we need to go where the people are you need to and, and this is going to be a pull uh this is not going to be a push we're not going to be you know pushing people to consume this. This is going to be when people are looking for information, we want to be uh, the top results. When I was looking for diabetes information, top three results were JDRF, NHS website, and um, WebMD. And I spent a lot of time going deep into their uh, their websites, trying to find all the links, afraid that I was missing something, trying to consume as much as I could, sitting on the sofa with my laptop, reading, reading, reading. Eventually, you have to get up. You can't, I mean, there's a limit to how many hours you can spend there. That's when I turned to podcasts. And I couldn't find one 
that that still gave me the sort of introductory information that I was able to get on a WebMD or a JDRF website. And I needed to be able to listen to that while I was driving or exercise or cooking or whatever else I might, I might be doing with my time. So yeah, I'm excited because you know, there's so, as you say, no two person has the same experience. And um, it's important for the individual that, that they be given the tools. But really, frankly, what I'm learning through my life and through the, this work is that it really comes down to the support on the caregivers. The, the amount of myth busting that I had to do, just to use the diabetes example, I mean, the, the questions that people had about, okay, so we, we, if she goes low, we give her insulin. That's not what you're supposed to do when she goes low. <laughs> um, uh, Well-intentioned uh, parents who did things like gave my daughter a bag of carrots at a birthday party um, because they they knew that she'd been diagnosed and they thought, well, she's not allowed to eat sugar, so we'll bring her carrots. Touching sentiment, misdirected, and and hard for an 11-year-old to, to, to have um, at a birthday party with all of her peers and a big, huge birthday cake to appear and then a bag of carrots. Um, so the, the, uh, the support that needs to come from around and outside of the information, you know, nobody spent as much time with the clinicians as me and my ex-wife did and my, my daughter learning about this. And then we need to then give all that information to the parents at the children's school and the grandparents and the aunts and uncles and the, uh, all the other support team around that to have them be able to understand what we're dealing with. And I think the same thing applies for stroke. And, you know, there's, there's stroke that happens in your 60s, 70s, 80s. So we're learning this also on the Parkinson's podcast we're creating, but it affects you entirely differently, as I've learned about from some of what you guys have created when you're di when you have a stroke in your 20s, 30s, 40s. It's an entirely different experience. And I, I've heard you, David, talk about some of that in terms of the, 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 the resources that were given to you. Um, I think you were in your 30s, right? And and then, you know, told about support groups of people in their 60s and 70s. Oh, my God, it's like getting you a bag of carrots at a birthday party, right? So true. Yeah. All right. Well, we're, we're going to wind down to the end here. Um, I have two more questions for you. And, All right. And we're... Um, we're hoping to kind of ride your tailwinds here, Dave, uh, uh, Dan, but bring us on a journey of where do you see, you know, this world of podcasting and mission-based media uh, going over the next five years or so? Okay. Well, I'll tell you where uh, it's not going. It's not going away. Um, the, when the pandemic started, uh, we had a, a huge knee-jerk response from our industry, from the health industry, healthcare industry, because suddenly all their typical pathways for being able to communicate their message were disrupted. They couldn't record videos because they couldn't get into the same room with people. They couldn't go to conferences and do product launches, and they couldn't go to events. They couldn't even get into hospitals or doctors' practices to be able to talk to them about their drug or product or uh, anything like that. Um, so it, it completely upended their 2020 strategy. So we saw a lot of knee-jerk reaction of, oh my God, what can we do? Oh, I know what we can do. We can take that podcast idea we've been noodling for years and we can actually innovate that. Look, I'm grateful in all the things I've been able to do in digital health and health innovation and now with podcasting to be able to be called up off the bench and get some playing time. Um, but what is, what is gonna, uh, what, what's going to happen going forward is this game is going to continue to stay with these players on the field. Uh, podcasting is now becoming a part of the communication strategy. What was seen as a tangent, maybe sort of like a TikTok or something like that, that was something well, we got to figure that out later with more people and more money. They're now realizing, actually, we can bring this into the fold with our overall communication strategy, our overall professional education strategy, our corporate social responsibility, our patient education. How do we bring this audio first content and integrate this into our, our pathway as opposed to thinking it's something separate that we have to have something separate once a week and, and do and go through all the approvals to get that stuff out there. So this is not going to go away. Um, where do I think this is going? I'll tell you, I've been doing a lot of work over the past few years to try to remove any self-limiting beliefs. And um, what I can tell you is that this is, uh, I feel like we're strapped onto a, ra a rocket ship and, um, and that we're, that our organization specifically and the people that, that are on the team are going to have a, a great ride here being able to make a real impact. But I think broadly across health and, and uh, society, I think podcasts are going to continue to grow in popularity, but they won't look or sound the same that they did from the beginning. The technology is going to change. I don't want to geek out on you, but the traditional RSS feed and the way that Apple sort of set this up using the blogging infrastructure that existed in the 90s and adapting that to podcasts, that's probably going to evolve into more um, uh, collaborative ways of sharing what we're doing 
doing right now is we're recording a podcast and it'll be consumed by people. There's not a real great opportunity for them to feed back unless you have a website or some sort of Discord or Slack or some sort of channel. Uh, so we're going to see podcasting become a two-way medium, just like Instagram and YouTube and all these other things are where people can comment and engage and uh, and do more interactive with the creator, be more interactive with the creators. Um, and what, what I hope we're going to be able to see as an organization is that we're going to be able to continue to focus on audio first, but not audio only. We want to collaborate with people who are creating videos, people who are creating books and courses and materials to, to help um, uh, advance health, whether it's N equals one or N equals 7 billion. We want to, we as an organization want to do different languages. We want to cover different care pathways in different parts of the world. Uh, we want to really serve the global community with this audio first information because you don't even need to be able to read. You don't even need to be able to be literate to be able to consume the sort of information that we're, we're sharing. Um, and I think we're up for an exciting, uh, exciting pathway uh, as other organizations, we've seen it with Macmillan, a uh, wonderful educational resource. You know, they were one of the early adopters in, into to podcasting when they bought the uh, what was it, Quick and Dirty Tips sort of series that they do around grammar and all sorts of things. Um, we'll see some more consolidation. Spotify is buying a lot of companies out there. Um, we'll, we'll see more uh, in the in the media space uh, of integrating podcasts into their overall content strategy. And I think that that will also be something where just like when I was involved with smartphone apps, we used to make software where hospitals made decisions and told doctors and patients what they were going to use. And then suddenly people started coming in, in 2008, 9 and 10 and saying, hey, I can get a mortgage or buy a car on my phone. Why can't I have access to my medical records? Well, guess what happened? Things started to change. And I think now as people are beginning to think about why do I have to read a book? Why do I have to read a website? Why do I have to read a why do I have to spend money printing brochures that are going to sit on a desk or on a wall in a pharmacy uh, before ever, anybody ever consumes them? Why can't I get this information? out there in a searchable way that can be consumed more easily. I think that that's just going to continue to grow and accelerate the, the, the impact uh, of this audio first content. Great, great, great answer there. And um, normally we finish with our magic wand question, but I think, I think you just summed up the magic wand and nailed it. I mean, it, so. immersive, uh, the insights about um, the, the podcast, where that's going, that that's, that's fantastic, and I and I, I look forward to to seeing that come because we're 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 Mike and I have been talking about how do we bring in guests after because we talk about how figuring out the technology and getting the podcast up and getting it live and getting it good quality, and then we're like, well, what? Maybe we could also live stream. Maybe we could bring because we want to make that. So I know it's great to hear that it's going there, and that's we want to bring in sort of the after pod experience. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, um, it's really exciting. Um, because I think the, you know, as a practicing clinician, what is getting missed more and more in the hurried in the, you know, declining reimbursements and the time and the volume of patients that you need to see is the patient education piece. And to have this as part of the playbook or the pathway, whether it be for orthopedics or, or, or brain injury or Parkinson's, it, it's, um, I think you're, you're on the, you're, you're absolutely on the right path. And we're glad that we're going to play a small part in the, in, in our, uh, in our community's um, ability to, to learn more from this, from this partnership. So um, yeah. I, I, I just wanted to chime in. It's all about people, yeah. you know, everything, it comes down to people uh, and trying to, to make an impact. And I'm really pleased that we connected. You mentioned Eugene and Jim earlier. G uh, Eugene is one of the two people who I credit that opened the, the, the opportunity for me to start on this path. He was uh, working at a pharmaceutical company and he said yes to me when I said, this is what I can do. This is the sort of impact I can have if I can create this podcast series around digital health. And he said, yes. The other person was Michelle Longmire, who I'd met in 2013, established a relationship with, uh, you know, admiring the, some 
some of the work that she was doing with Google Glass and uh, an early app that she'd made for dermatology and seeing her journey that led to Medible um, and, and her success that she's having there. Um, so she was this, the other person who said yes to me very early and said, yes, uh, we, we think that this podcast should exist on digital health today. Um, and, and that's what opened up this door. So I really, uh, people that are listening to this, get in touch with me. Please let me know if there's something that we can do to collaborate because I really uh, believe that this is a great way to, to connect with people. Hopefully some of what I've said has resonated with you. And if there's anything that you think we could do to collaborate and do more good uh, and, and have a bigger impact, I'm, I'm open to ideas. That's brilliant, Dan. Um, you know, it's, it's really unique what you're doing and unique what you started on a mission years ago to, to deliver and even, you know, what you have today. Um, you know, it, it's, it's good, just the foundation, but yeah, we're excited to uh, be a part of this journey and hopefully be on that rocket ship with you to take it off here shortly. So I'm excited um, too. Thank you. Guys. <laughs> thank you. It's been a pleasure here, Dan. We'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, enjoy the hot long summer there in London, Kent, Kent, like, it's a beautiful area down there, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's you, the garden you, of England. It's the garden of England. Garden Actually. Of England. Yeah. My, my, uh, I've traced my father's side of the, com of, uh, the family back to Kent back in early 1800s. So, uh, yeah. one of my great, 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 great grandfathers was a shipwright working in Chatham, England, uh, Chatham, Kent, England in the early 1800s and moved to Philadelphia to begin building there. So he built ships and I try to build bridges uh, through through podcasts and connections like this. So uh, really appreciate you guys being a part of the journey. I love what you're doing. Keep up the great work and thanks for having me on. Thank you, Dan. And you didn't, didn't uh, Mike started by saying the, uh, he gave you the title of the OG of, of, of podcasting in the space and, and didn't hear this going on, but right, right down to the mic check at the beginning, before we start recording, Dan knew right away <laughs> that my mic was not on. So something as simple as uh, flipping the mute button off. So Dan, this has been a pleasure. Um, and uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing your expertise today and your passion for what you do. So um, look for more um, as we continue to grow this partnership, but I, I, I really thank you for um, coming on our show today. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Dan.